I want to begin this lesson by reading to you an article. This is current news. This is an article from February 22nd, 2021. Maine congregations, this is the state of Maine, Maine congregations faced with stay away from church or go to jail. Unconscionable and frightening. That's how Pastor Ken Graves describes the impossible choice Maine Governor Janet Mills is forcing on Calvary Chapel of Bangor. In essence, it's stay away from church or go to jail. I am responsible for overseeing and managing all the affairs that the Lord Jesus Christ gave me in my role as under-shepherd of his church at Calvary Chapel. That's what Graves declared in court filings yesterday. Graves takes his calling and his Lord very seriously. Liberty Council is defending Graves, Calvary Chapel of Bangor, and the Calvary Residential Discipleship Program against Mills' unconstitutional COVID orders, which are now the most severe in the nation. Those illegal orders have been in place for an unbelievable 340 days. Graves has been ministering to the broken for decades. By God's grace, the Calvary Residential Discipleship Outreach has rescued addicts from the abyss, redeeming their souls and renewing their lives. This 12-month residential program houses 48 men and women looking to free themselves of addiction and relearn life at the foot of the cross. Group Bible study takes place daily, and CRD participants attend church twice a week with the seven or eight pastoral staff members. On Sundays, the residents meet and worship with Calvary Chapel's full congregation, an important part of their recovery program. And that's where the problem comes in. Mills, that's the governor, initially banned all worship, then raised the number to 10 and now 50. Substance abuse treatment centers were deemed essential and have no numerical limit. The CRD residents can receive counseling, but as soon as the Bible is open and they worship, the assembly becomes illegal. And that continues to this day. Under Mills's COVID orders, secular programs can serve any number of people assembled, but the moment a group of 50 or more worships, the entire meeting comes under the restrictions on places of worship. The CRD residents and staff alone have 56 people, six more than Mills allows to worship, and that number does not include the rest of the Calvary Chapel members who also meet for church. Mills' orders place Calvary Chapel members and CRD participants in a terrible predicament, forcing them to choose to either forsake the worship of God or be charged with a crime. Graves and Calvary Chapel cannot keep CRD residents or members away from church, as Mills demands, because the church itself is essential for everyone who attends. It is not an option for Calvary Chapel to preclude its members and congregants from attending religious worship services at Calvary Chapel. That is the reason Calvary Chapel exists, to be a church, a place of healing and redemption for members, congregants, and visitors. And here is where you respond, I never thought I'd see the day. This is your America. This is what half the country voted for last November. Restrictions on everything, including religious freedom. Go to church, go to jail. Joshua in the Old Testament would be the first one to say, being a follower of the living God does not mean that you get a life free from conflict. Uh, Johnny Cash said the same. Being a Christian isn't for sissies. It takes a real man to live for God, a lot more than to live for the devil. And Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, said, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. There is another man in the book of Joshua who experienced both great conflict and great blessing. And this man, if he lived uh, in Maine today, would say, I am going to go to church and I'm going to go to jail. I am going to stand up for God no matter what the consequences might be. I might be old, but I've got steel in my spine. It comes from my faith, and God is going to honor that. I'm talking about Caleb. Let me give you the background here, and then we'll get into the next chapter of the book of Joshua. The story of Caleb begins in the book of Numbers. After being miraculously delivered from bondage in Egypt, the children of Israel were led by God to the border of the land of Canaan, the promised land. And there Moses chose 12 men, one from each tribe, to scout out the land before entering. And among them were Caleb and Joshua. 
And these 12 men spied out the land for 40 days, and then they returned to Moses. They reported that the land was fruitful, but that its inhabitants were large and strong. Ten of the 12 spies warned Moses not to enter the land of Canaan. I still wonder what they were planning for their future if they were refusing to take the land that God had given them. But then fear is oftentimes irrational, like uh, children who are scared of the dark in their own home. In Numbers 13 and verse 30, Caleb steps up. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Now, the we parts of that statement do not reflect self-confidence or uh, any kind of overestimation of the Israelites' fighting skills. The we parts of that statement reflect Caleb's faith in God and in his promises. He had faith that God would give them the victory over the Canaanites because God said that he would. And if God said it, then I believe it. Well, you know what happened. We've been over this story both on Wednesdays and on Sundays this year. The people of Israel ignored Caleb and listened to the report of the other spies. Numbers 14 tells us that the people talked about electing a new leader to replace Moses, and they even entertained the idea of stoning Joshua and Caleb to death. God was exceedingly angry with his people. He even threatened to destroy them until Moses interceded for them. God relented, but he decreed that the people would wander in the wilderness until all of that faithless generation had died. God added, But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to, and his descendants will inherit it. The Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years until all of that generation except Joshua and Caleb died. After the 40 years of wandering, plus five more years of war within Canaan, that's what we've been studying here in the book of Joshua, Caleb is 85 years old when we come back to his story in the book of Joshua. In our last study, we were in uh, chapter 10. Let's, let's skim through the next three chapters of Joshua. You're going to see in the second part of chapter 10, Joshua chapter 10, that the southern cities of Canaan were conquered. Then in chapter 11, the northern cities are conquered. You can read through these chapters on your own, and uh, they're very ordered, and they're not very um, inspirational. But they are important in letting us know that Joshua and the Israelites did take the land. Well, the land promised to them by God. Chapter 12 is a list of kings that they defeated, and then chapter 13 shows us how the land was divided up among the tribes. Uh, you might have a, a map like this one in your Bible. Well, that brings us to the conclusion of Caleb's story in Joshua chapter 14. Forty-five years after Moses sent the spies into the promised land to check it out, Caleb reminds Joshua of a promise that was left unfulfilled. This rugged old man who God said had a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly had a word for Joshua. I'm reading from Joshua chapter 14 and verse 6. Now, the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day Moses swore to me, The land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Caleb was 40 years old when Moses made him that promise. 45 years have now passed. Did Caleb forget that promise? No, he didn't. Did he think about it every day for 45 years? I cannot prove it, but I bet he did. Impatient with the nonsense of his people as they refused to trust? There are times when I felt the same way as a pastor. 
confused about the timing, wondering if he would kick the bucket before he got to lay eyes on the fulfillment of that promise. He reminds Joshua of what Moses swore to him. It is time to collect on that promise, same uh, chapter and verse 10. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Remember that 12 spies checked out the land, all 12 agreed on the value of the land. All 12 agreed on the description of the people and the cities, but only two said that the land could be taken. How could 12 of God's people see the same thing and come to wildly different conclusions? You know, there are times that I've wondered about that as a pastor. God said, my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly. And this comes out in his speech to Joshua at the age of 85. And I want you to count the number of times the words, the Lord, are mentioned in his speech in verses 6 through 12 of this chapter. I mean, you can even pause this recording if you want to do this on your own. Go back, look at those verses that we just read. How many times does Caleb say, the Lord? You can circle them in your Bible if you want. How many times does Caleb mention the Lord? Seven times. Now add two more times uh, the mention of God in those verses, and the total is nine. What marked Caleb as having a different spirit? His mind was focused on God. Focusing on the Lord brings courage. That's where his strength came from. That's where his confidence came from. Remember Simon Peter uh, venturing out on the surface of the water? He stepped out of the boat, he saw Jesus, and when he focused on Jesus, he was able to walk on the surface, but when he took his eyes off Jesus, what happened? He sank. Focusing on the Lord brings courage. In verses 10 and 11 of this chapter, Caleb reminded Joshua, so here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. And when you read that, you believe him, don't you? Now, you're going to be impressed with this. I have, a, I have a photograph of Caleb. I mean, I've got a picture of this sturdy, gray-headed man of courage, a man ready to drive the Canaanites out of the portion of land that he is going to claim. Do you want to see his picture? Are you ready? Here it is. Yeah, there's the man. The man who is undeterred. This old soldier is ready to go to war. He is ready to start the next chapter of his life at 85 years old. He is not delusional. His faith drives his courage. Here's the second lesson. Focusing on the Lord helps you tune out the doubters. And there will always be doubters. For the majority of his life, Caleb had been around doubters. Uh, faithless people who were being punished for their unbelief, cynics, people who are not innocent questioners, but rebellious, as the author of Hebrews called them, people who wanted to return to slavery in Egypt. Do you know these people? I do. There are some people who wallow in misery. They're only happy when they're unhappy. They would rather pull you down than allow you to pull them up. They are the lobsters in Maine. You know, we've been to Maine twice to assist our, our mission partners. There are actually three trips total. Each of those times, our, our group has been allowed to take a tour of a local lobstery. Is that a word? The, the ferals have a relationship with these people, these professional uh, lobstermen. Lobsters are the cockroach of the sea. Mean uh, little creatures. Uh, they may be valuable in the grocery store, but uh, the, these, these little thugs, the the expert fisherman told us that if two male lobsters get into a trap together, they won't allow the other to escape. They will fight to keep the other one inside the trap. I know people like that. They are going down and they don't want the others in their life, even their friends and family, to succeed. 
They, they have made a mess of their life, and they want to see everybody else do the same. Their attitudes are toxic. These are the people that Caleb heard for four decades as they loitered in the wilderness waiting to die. But the bad attitude of the majority did not infect Caleb. His focus remained on the Lord. He tuned out the doubters. When Moses sent the 12 spies into the promised land, Caleb saw something that troubled him. It was the town of Hebron. If you don't remember uh, Hebron, very, it's a very significant and special place, at least it was to the Hebrew people. Hebron was the only piece of land that Abraham, the father of the Jews, ever owned. Abraham buried his wife Sarah there. Abraham was also buried there, as were Isaac and Rebekah and Jacob. When Caleb, the spy, saw Hebron, the sacred town was inhabited by unholy people. And that bothered Caleb. It bothered him so much that he made a special request of Moses. When we go in, I want Hebron. Give me Hebron. I want to take care of it. Judges 1.20 says, As Moses had promised, Hebron was given to Caleb, who drove from it the three sons of Anak. Forty-five years after Moses made the promise, Caleb was ready to collect. We are back in Joshua chapter 14. And verses 13 and 14. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, ever since, because, why? Because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Now, we find out in the next chapter that Hebron did not come easy, uh, but it was a holy cause, and Caleb got it. Look ahead to Joshua chapter 15 and verse 13. In accordance with the Lord's command to him, Joshua gave to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, a portion in Judah, Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron. Arba was the forefather of Anak. From Hebron, Caleb drove out the three Anakites, Sheshai, Ahiman, and Talmai, the sons of Anak. This 85-year-old man had come to do some fighting. Remember, living in the promised land doesn't mean an absence of conflict, Christian. But it does mean the Lord is with you and he fights alongside of you. You will never have a problem-free life. Jesus said it. You will have troubles at every age. Even when you're faithful to God when others aren't, even when you follow him in obedience, there are still going to be battles to fight. There are still problems for rich people, for poor people, for young, for old, for single people and retired people and spiritual people and millionaire professional golfers and Christians who want to go to church in the state of Maine. Problems. But not all people see problems in the same way. There are some people who are overcome by their problems, while others are overcomers. Some people become bitter, others become better. Some people cower in fear, others stand firm in faith. If the children of Israel in the wilderness serve as bad examples, then thank God for Joshua and the other spy, Caleb. They are exceptional. They are promised land people. They have that attitude that pleases God. God blessed Caleb for his faithfulness and patience and encouragement to us to believe God and follow him wholeheartedly. Like Caleb, we should trust God, patiently waiting for him to fulfill his promises and to take action when the time is right. Let me make one more point here, um, carefully, before I close. And I hope this doesn't get me into trouble, but I don't feel like this lesson is complete unless I do my due diligence. I, I want to do right by you. And I got stuck on Joshua chapter 14 and verse 10. Let me give you the third point here and then, uh, then I'll talk about it. Following the Lord brings adventure at every stage of life. We've already seen that there is another level of Christian living represented by entering into the promised land. 
It's a land of adventure and conflict and victory in Jesus. Every Christian can get to this level. It just requires obedience and faith. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians, they, they just don't want to, to do that. They don't want to follow the Lord uh, wholeheartedly. They think that it's okay to, to love Jesus and then do what they want. And that's unfortunate. In Joshua chapter 14 and verse 10, Caleb said to Joshua, Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses, while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. Why, I ask you, did Caleb feel compelled to remind Joshua of his age? Because Caleb was no longer a spring chicken. You say, people lived longer back then. No, no, no. They lived longer before the flood. A lot of time has passed since the flood. In Caleb's time, 85 was 85. That's why Caleb makes a big deal of this. Caleb was saying to Joshua, I'm an old man. I am an old man. But... But, verse 11, I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. One of our senior men, whom I admire greatly, pulled me aside a few weeks ago. And he said, you know, Pastor, you ought to, uh, you ought to preach a sermon series on how to grow old well. And I said, um, I don't know if I'm qualified to do that because I don't have experience yet in that area. And he responded, well, if you don't preach it, then who will? I'll think about that, but I don't feel confident leading where I have not walked. I, I just don't have the credibility. But Caleb does have something to say today to the octogenarian believers. This man had not given up. He had a dream and he had a promise. And he had held on to that promise for 45 years. And no one was going to say to him, you've done a good job now, so uh, rest, rest, and let the younger guys have their turn. No, Caleb was still a fighter. God had not only preserved the promise for the man, but he had preserved the man for the promise. Caleb was 85 years old before he settled down. He was 20 years past retirement, which I'm not sure is a biblical concept anyway. I mean, I've always heard it said that retirement is God's call for you into full-time ministry. I'm not sure I could preach a sermon, a series on growing old well, but Caleb could. Uh, he would say, God is not through with you no matter how old you are. You still have a dream? You still have a promise? you still have breath in your lungs and a twinkle in your eye, then you can fight one more battle. You've got it in you. Douglas MacArthur said, Years may wrinkle the skin, but to give up interest wrinkles the soul. You are as young as your faith, as old as your doubt, as young as your self-confidence, as old as your fear, as young as your hope, and as old as your despair. In the central place of every heart, there is a recording chamber. So long as it receives messages of beauty, hope, cheer, and courage, so long are you young. When your heart is covered with the snows of pessimism and the ice of cynicism, then and only then are you grown old. And then, indeed, as the ballad says, you just fade away. The promises of God that were true when you were young, are true when you are old. Your future may be um, uncertain, but the word impossible is not a part of the Christian's vocabulary. We have seen God do the impossible numerous times already in this study. I mean, in the last lesson, God made the sun stand still. Caleb wanted to take Mount Hebron, and his age was just a number to him. In your own strength, there are many impossibilities, but you can claim this promise. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. One pastor used this outline for a sermon on Caleb's life. His points were never release God's promises, never retire from serving God, never retreat from the enemy. Those are some good lessons. If you do this, then you too can thrive 
at 85. I want to share a poem with you here to close about Caleb's courage. And I, I wish I knew who wrote it so I could give credit, uh, uh, but it comes to me anonymously. It captures the attitude of this old warrior. He stood before Joshua with flashing eyes. Give me this mountain before I die. But Caleb, you're old and the mountain is high. Choose a peaceful spot on this plain to die. The people who live on the mountain are strong. The battle you fight will be bloody and long. His eyes never wavered as he spoke without fear. I've been promised this mountain for 45 years. And as for the people being mighty and tall, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. For it's not my strength on which I'm counting, for the Lord is going to give me that mountain. So let's quit talking while it is still light, for the Lord and I have a battle to fight. What courage. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you once again for inspiration from the book of Joshua. And this time, it comes from an 85-year-old who had not given up on life. And we see that what drove him was not good genes, and it was not uh, uh, optimism and the power of positive thinking. Lord, what drove him was his faith in you, a man who uh, followed you wholeheartedly. We want a bit of that. We want to be able to follow you so that uh, for, for each of us, uh, age is only a number. So that for each of us, as we march forward and we claim your promises, you continue to build adventure into our lives. Father, we thank you for the future. We thank you for what is to come. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.